Lando, Pedring, Rolly, Ulysses, Pepeng, Glenda, Pablo. Sounds familiar? How about Sendong, Odette, Yolanda? This could be the name of your father, your mother, your lolo, your lola, your tita, your tito. It could even be the name of your ex who broke your heart. That's our secret. But no, seriously, to millions of Filipinos, these names have left an indelible mark. These names trigger trauma because these are the names of the most destructive and catastrophic typhoons and storms to have hit the Philippines in the last 15 years alone. And that means everyone in this room, I suppose, has lived through these storms one way or another. Sendong hits especially close to home because it ravaged Cagayan de Oro City where I lived. I could remember it clearly. I had a bird's eye view from inside an airplane of the entire city a day after tropical storm Sendong hit us. Entire residences were wiped out, covered entirely in mud. People gathering at the bridges, both dead and alive. This storm claimed the lives of over a thousand people, left over a thousand missing, and displaced 110,000 families. And while this might be just statistics to you or a record breaker, for me and my city, that meant losing the lives of the people we love the most. We have documented one college professor who until today is searching by foot the entire region of Mindanao for his firstborn son. It has been more than 10 years and he hasn't stopped. And this is not an isolated case. All of us have our own Baguio stories. If not us, someone close to us. If not, a friend of someone close to us. That's just the reality. But see, typhoons, while typhoons and storms are natural phenomenon, quote unquote, the warming climate intensifies these typhoons and storms to be more destructive than it already is. And scientific consensus has revealed, not me, not my friends, scientific consensus has revealed that the warming of the earth is directly linked to anthropogenic pressures or human interventions or our fault. Sorry. And so when you, in essence, in my opinion, it is not the storm that takes the life of a human being. To me, it is the human being that takes the life of its own. When you come to think about it, it's like 21st century barbarism, self-inflicted genocide, mass extermination without us even knowing. And we are all going to die. Okay, cut. <sighs> Stressful. Did I make you uncomfortable in your seats? Trigger some trauma, some fear, some helplessness, some hopelessness about the imminent danger of the climate crisis? I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, because that is exactly how we are framing conversations of the climate crisis. Yeah, that is exactly the only way we're talking about it. But is this the only way to talk about it, to talk about the climate crisis? What if there was an alternative option? What if there was a more hopeful way to talk about the climate crisis? Now, take a look at these front page stories that we collected in December 2011. These show what the mainstream media looked like a day after tropical storm Sendong hit Cagayan de Oro City. If I could summarize this, I know you can't read it, it's just death, destruction, and disaster. Naturally, this is how the mainstream media covered the biggest story of that time. But it got me thinking, seeing these headlines. Why do we only talk about the environment when lives have already been lost? Why does nature only get on, the front, get on the front pages of the newspapers when it has already made us feel its wrath? More importantly, why are we talking about the crisis only after the crisis 
Why are we not talking about why the crisis exists in the first place? Or what aggravated that crisis in the first place? No storm of that intensity has ever hit Cagayan de Oro City in its history. But we only talked about how many people died. Let me push the envelope even further. A study by Harvard Humanitarian Initiative in 2019 revealed that there is a low level of climate change awareness among Filipinos. And this is ironic. When I read the results, I was like, this is so ironic because according to the World Risk Index, the world lands on the top one spot of the most disaster-prone country in the world. Wow, Pinoy pride. But no, seriously. Why would a country that, it has the, that is at the forefront of being the most negatively impacted by climate change have a citizenry, have a population that is low in awareness in terms of knowledge on climate change? I'm not done with the irony here. In the same study, in the same study, while it reveals that there is a low level of awareness on climate issues, there is a high level of concern on the risks of climate change. Hmm. Hmm. Low level of awareness, high level of concern. Mababang kamalayan, mataas na pag-alala. Wala akong masyadong alam, pero dude, pare chong, takot na takot ako. Bakit kaya? Bakit kaya may ganitong irony? Low level of awareness, high level of concern. And I go back to the way we frame our conversations on climate stories. I observe that the only way we talk about it is from the lens of death, destruction, and disaster. And this sparks fear, not sparks fly, but sparks fear. And this overwhelming fear and concern of climate change and its effects paralyze us. And this paralysis leads to ignorance that persists. And this ignorance leads to action that stagnates. Filipinos, we are more afraid to confront the climate issue instead of wanting to know more about it and act on it because of the kind of information available to us. It's obvious from the photos right in front of you. It's all doom and gloom. It's all intimidation. But how much of this information can be used by audiences like you? How are you going to be encouraged to take action if this is the only way we cover the climate story? Psychologists actually already have a term for this, and we call it echo anxiety. Echo anxiety, echo anxiety is a feeling of fear and unease about the health of our climate and of the well-being of future generations. It usually manifests when you are confronted with environmental information, hopelessness, helplessness that you felt in the beginning. Now, what kind of information is out there? Data suggests that many of us young people today actively avoid news. Who reads the news every hour here? I don't see any hands. In a study of Reu by Reuters Institute, around 40 to 42% of those aged 18 to 35 actively avoid news. Is it because of all the bad and sad news that we are consuming? Now, this occurrence of news avoidance is problematic because the media sets, has the power to set the agenda of a community. This is covered in what Maxwell McCombs proposed called the agenda setting theory of the media, where he says that there is a correlation between the issues being covered by the media and the issues being perceived as important by its audiences. Meaning, whatever the media talks about is what we talk about. Whatever we read on the news, whatever we hear on the radio, watch on TV, scroll on our phones, that's the only topic of our conversations. And madalas hindi natin ito pinag-uusapan kung hindi ito pinag-uusapan ng media. So people are tired of bad news, and especially bad news about the climate. But look at this graph. In the digital news report analysis of Reuters Institute, it revealed that of all countries listed there, the Philippines ranks first as having a population interested in climate news. Yay, Pinoy pride again. We top this list. Just to recap where we are so far, these are the facts. I have 
vomited. First, there is a low level of awareness on climate change, but there is a high level of concern on climate risks. Next, there is a high level of avoidance of bad news, but there is a high level of interest on climate news. What does this mean? This means that for writers and reporters, we need to write better our environment and climate stories. For readers and audiences, that means we need to choose to consume better stories about the climate and the environment. So the main challenge right now is how might we communicate climate stories that inspire courageous action instead of instilling fear? And this is why we founded the Association of Young Environmental Journalists, or AYEJ, to address the challenge on the quality and quantity of environmental stories and information being shared. AYEJ is an ecological literacy nonprofit organization founded by young people, and we work to engage and encourage civil society on environmental issues uh, through hope-based communications and solutions journalism. The work of Ayedge is based on what we call the ABCs of Ayedge. A is amplifying conversations where we connect young people with experts to have a knowledge exchange. B is the core of our work, building capacity, where we train emerging and professional journalists, communicators, and media professionals the knowledge and skills they need to tell more positive stories about the issues of this generation. So far, we have trained over a thousand journalists and media professionals, not only in the Philippines, but also in Southeast Asia. We've gone as far as Boracay, uh, Iloilo, even Dumaguete, Oriental Mindoro, and even the indigenous young leaders of Bukidnon. After we've built the capacities, our C is creating content. And we have written hundreds of positive stories about uh, hope-based stories about environmental initiatives and solutions being done by communities. Our stories have been published on Rappler, Inquirer, Mongabe, and others. Now, these stories right in front of you, these were not written by veteran journalists already in the industry for 25 years. These were written by young people just like you who may be tired of the way we talk about the climate crisis. Visual storytelling is also part of our work. This is one of the first, if you can play this video, um, where we documented how women are becoming entrepreneurs in Apo Island in Negros by upcycling pre-loved jeans and pants. Ayedj also just finished Kwentong Kalikasan, where we produced 14 episodes about the plight and the solutions being done around Bukidnon and Misamis Oriental when it comes to forest conservation. This was aired on Knowledge Channel and shared to far-flung communities in Bukidnon and Misamis Oriental. Now, one thing that our content has in common is our desire and goal to inspire courageous action instead of instilling fear. We found that more than 96% of our audiences surveyed take, are encouraged to take action because of the content that is right in front of them. And we think we were able to solicit these kinds of responses because of the way we packaged our stories. So instead of screaming in front of young people telling you you're all going to die in five years, we package stories of solutions being done by communities so that more people are able to join the bandwagon. How, we, how do we do this specifically at the edge? We adapted the hope-based communications approach. You may not be writers, all of you, but as critical consumers of the media, it's important that you can identify these shifts. So what does hope-based communications look like? From problems to solutions, instead of focus, focusing solely on the problems posed by climate change and environmental issues, we can highlight innovative solutions uh, being taken to address these problems. From threats to opportunities, Rather than emphasizing the doom and gloom associated with environmental threat, we can shift the narrative to highlight the opportunities that arise from these issues. Instead of portraying communities or individuals affected by disasters as helpless victims, relying on resilience, we can frame them as heroes who are actively working towards positive change. Rather than focusing solely on highlighting issues or criticizing, we can emphasize our shared values, our shared dreams. What do we stand for together?
And now you might be thinking, ah, hope-based communications is just toxic positivity. Diba? It kind of forgets the urgency and the realities of the problems that we face. But no. In fact, hope-based communications leverages and builds on the urgency and the reality of the problems that we face. Remember, there is a plethora of information available on the negative impacts of climate change. But how much usable information is available on what, is, what can be done and what is currently being done to address them? To reiterate, hope-based communications is not ignoring the problems. It's not seeing the world with rose-colored glasses. Everything is fine. No. It is providing an alternative narrative to the news diet that we have that consists mostly of bad news. It is suggesting us to take a look at the context of why issues are happening as well as the solutions to help us move forward. So, we have the what. We have the so what. But where is the what now? What? Climate change is here. So what? We're in trouble. Unless. This is what's missing in our current narrative. This is what we need to include in our current narrative. This is what we need to talk more about. What now? What can I do now? Norwegian social worker and environmental activist Newt Bjorlikog talked about ecological love. A deep connection to our homes and our shared environments. And it got me thinking, with all this information on death, destruction, and disaster, how can we develop a deep connection with something that we are so afraid of? Maybe the answer lies in the way we communicate our ecological love. Thank you.